Delivering the meaning of yes is so important in every business, every business. Even if you're a doctor, you have an obligation to not make your patients wait an hour to see you. Yes, your services are important, but their time is important too, as yours and so is mine. And when you're on vacation, it's even more important because each guest may only have one week of vacation a year. Maybe, maybe they're lucky enough to two. And you have to make every day memorable and exciting. So everyone on the team has to say yes, even if they want a tea kettle because they're from England and they're not used to not having one in Maui, but they want one. Right. So you make it happen. Right. There's a cost, a couple of, couple of bucks to make. Right. No issue. You say yes. And with your example with a plate, I would have gone ballistic. Yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me? How about deliver five plates to the room with utensils and napkins? Yeah. It, it, it's, it's just incomprehensible to me. Welcome to the Pivotal Leader Podcast with Gina Tremarco, featuring lively interviews with CEOs, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who share their stories and best practices for shifting business from problems to profits. Sit back and get ready to pivot. Hey, everyone. This is Gina Tremarco, Chief Results Officer of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. Each week on The Pivotal Leader, I feature inspirational leaders who know how to positively impact their customers, employees, and brand through culture building. On this episode of The Pivotal Leader, I'm interviewing Stephen J. Klubeck, a self-made entrepreneur with more than 30 years experience across every aspect of hospitality design, development, and deployment, and author of the new book, Checking In, hospitality-driven thinking, business, and you. As the original founder and former CEO and chairman of Diamond Resorts International, a business that grew to become the second largest vacation ownership company worldwide with more than 400 properties across 33 countries in its portfolio, Klubeck made a name for himself as the industry's most adamant advocate for radical customer service, what he calls embracing the meaning of yes. For his commitment to serving the hospitality industry and amplifying his economic impact nationwide, Klubeck was appointed by Commerce Secretary Gary Locke to serve as the inaugural chairman of the board in Brand USA Inc., a U.S. government-formed nonprofit corporation with the sole mission of promoting travel to the United States. As Brand USA's leading voice, Klubeck coordinated with the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of State, the Department of Commerce, Congress, the White House, and leading American business in a first effort to efficiently, effectively, and economically make the United States a more welcoming and accessible international travel destination for millions of would-be visitors around the globe. But to Klubeck's own amusement, he is perhaps most frequently recognized for his appearances on CBS's hit TV show, Undercover Boss. Featured on multiple episodes across multiple seasons, Klubeck to this day ranks as the most generous boss who has ever participated in the unscripted program. So I am super thrilled to have Stephen on The Pivotal Leader today. And, you know, we've had so many amazing guests on this show, but today's guest really resonates with me for several reasons, and I hope he can bear through hearing this. So number one, I grew up in the hotel industry, and it's one of our core industries that we service as a training company, so that's exciting. Number two, I learned he has roots in Chicago, as do I, because I'm from there. And reading about his entrepreneurial dad reminds me of my dad. Number three, I love the episode of The Undercover Boss that featured him. And then number four, his philosophy of the meaning of yes as it runs parallel to our core improv-based training philosophy of yes and. So I was like super thrilled when I saw that in the book. So Stephen, welcome to The Pivotal Leader today. Thank you very much for having me. I want to jump in and start with a scenario, which I don't normally do that, but I want to run this scenario by you. of One of the experiences I've had in the hotel industry as a trainer, and I, I want to run it by you because I just want to hear your reaction because I'm pretty sure I know what, how you're going to react. So I was working with this five-star resort and my job was director of training and my job was to get training in place and make sure everybody was delivering a five-star experience. And so I was shadowing the front desk one day, just, just trying to, I always try to like learn what they're going through and what their challenges are before I start like going, this is how you're going to do things. And I watched a guest come up to the front desk and ask for a plate because she said she had ordered a pizza and wanted to know if she could have a plate. And the front desk person said, where did you get the pizza from? Did you get it from us or did you get it from someone else? 
And she said, well, no, we ordered it in. We're, we're working through, we're doing a biz- business in our room right now, just working through and ordered it. He's like, yeah, no, see, we can't give, we can't give you a plate because the chef will charge us for it. So we, we can't give you a plate. And I nearly choked him. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a company I'd like to buy. Right? Everything I was I'd reading. Like to, I'd like to buy that company. Yeah. Well, we could talk about it offline. I didn't last there very long because the culture, that was just one indication of the culture, just to give you, I'm sure you know what that culture was like, if that's what I was dealing with and getting that turned around. I I, I saw that firsthand and I saw it in so many places. And those are the companies I like to buy because <laughs> I can change the culture quickly. Yeah, that's what I want to talk about. So for example, you know, I'm an F&B guy. I've done every job in the business. I was a busboy, a waiter, a cook, assistant cook, not a real cook. I can cook too. And I've done front desk. I've done engineering. I've done housekeeping. And when I talk to guests of a broken company, you have to have a certain demeanor. And when I put my business card at every front desk, it changed everyone's attitude. Some people thought it was crazy because I put myself way out there. And it was my real email and my real cell phone number. But what happened, it was counterintuitive. Everyone that worked with me knew my business card was there and I would return emails and phone calls immediately. And then I'd fire off a correction. We'd make the guest happy instantaneously. And then three more people would call the guest. So they got bombarded with love. And delivering the meaning of yes is so important in every business, every business. Even if you're a doctor, you have an obligation to not make your patients wait an hour to see you. Yes, Mm -hmm. your services are important, but their time is important too, as yours and so is mine. And when you're on vacation, it's even more important because each guest may only have one week of vacation a year. Maybe, maybe they're lucky enough to two. And you have to make every day memorable and exciting. So everyone on the team has to say yes, even if they want a tea kettle because they're from England and they're not used to not having one in Maui, but they want one. So you make it happen. Right. There's a cost, a couple of a couple of bucks to make right. no issue. You say yes. And with your example with the plate, I would have gone ballistic. Yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me? How about deliver five plates to the room with utensils and napkins? Yeah. It, it, it's it's just incomprehensible to me. I I lost it. And I, I, I couldn't lose it in front of the cust of in front of the guest, but I lost it. But I did on Undercover Boss, the second show I was on, I lost it in front of a guest and our team members. They didn't give them a proper discount. I was on the cover boss more than anyone else. Yeah. And the second time, you know, nobody nobody knew who I was because I had this great getup. Yeah. You know, I had earrings. Go figure I that. Earrings. It. Midwestern, <laughs> Midwestern boy with earrings. <laughs> and um, spiky hair and earrings. And uh, the guest wasn't given certain discount for a wedding. And I absolutely went nuts. And I said, how can you treat this guest this way? This is a hotel. We just took over a bunch of properties. And they didn't understand. They weren't trained yet the diamond way. And I went crazy. I ended up paying for the wedding. She started crying. But they had a good time. But it really, simple things. It's so easy to say yes. And I never, ever, ever told my team members, you're going to get in trouble with me if you take care of a guest. If you don't, then you will get in trouble. But the simple things, right? Like you just said, I'm not going to be upset. Would it cost the company five bucks, three bucks? Who cares? Yeah. Cost the company nothing because the memory we created was priceless in the long scheme of things. And if you create those memories with your guests, and everyone is your guest, whether you're having friends for dinner or you're working in a dry cleaner or you got a doctor's office or you're in hospitality, we all are in hospitality. I read that that's your philosophy as well, is that no matter what we're doing, no matter what job we are, or what industry we are, we're all in hospitality. And you talk about this in your book and checking in, which I love that title. You mentioned that as the May 2018, the five biggest company, Apple, Google, owned by Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and Facebook, all these multi-billion dollar companies. And while they're technology companies, it's only a part of the story. Can you talk a little bit more about like what's that bigger part? Well. You can get disintermediated pretty quickly and you always have to watch out for that if you're not watching your game every day. And I never had a day off because I loved what I did. It's passion. And these companies exude passion. My company exuded passion at the highest levels for me. I woke up every day, actually never went to bed because, yeah, I sleep a little. 
but it's too exciting. It's fun. Mm -hmm. And people say, how can you deal with 600 emails a day? Well, you do it. Are you that passionate? And it's not a chore. It's a joy. If you want to be a Broadway singer, or you want to be a director in movies, or if you want to be in the hospitality business, or you want to be a financier, or you want to work for the Peace Corps, I don't care. But if I see that passion, that's what excites me. And I tell, I, I tell everyone, that's the key. Be happy. Be passionate. Money will come if that's your goal. And money will come if that's not your goal. If you run your business properly, it will just self-fulfill. Or if you want to just do philanthropy and give your time, you will be rewarded with the joys of helping others. And I do all those things. I, I, I try to live my more full life. And I won't put up with any nonsense, any bullshit. Don't be passionate. Enjoy it. And yeah, you could say some funky things sometimes, but it shows your passion and your caring. And you will be successful as a leader. What about those leaders? Okay, so you're an entrepreneur. I'm an entrepreneur. What about those leaders who, you know, I've worked with many general managers, both at, from the consultant side and being on the inside, those general managers that of a hotel or any business that don't have that passion. And clearly, when you have employees who won't give a guest a plate, that culture, the tone is set by that leader. Now, is that an issue because that leader wasn't an owner of the, that property? How do they correct that kind of... I mean, I watched, I watched this organization become so dysfunctional and people just checked out mentally. <laughs> Funny, checked out, checking yeah. in. <laughs> I thought you'd like um, that. No, I've seen this before, and let me tell you where it comes from. It emanates from the top. So people couldn't put anything by me because I've done every job. I said, you need help making a bed? I'll help you. You want to fold towels? I'll show you how to fold them. I was totally in as the entrepreneur leader of the company, and I wouldn't allow general managers to exist in that world. They'd be done. They'd be done. And I get a, you know, I used to have a saying, go see HR. <laughs> and if and if I said go see HR, everyone kind of figured out what that meant. That means you were gone within two, three minutes. You were done. I just because a good firing is good. Yeah. It sets the tone. It sets the tone. And I do give everyone the opportunity, but there was a young lady that was running a resort in Williamsburg. And I called her at two AM. She didn't pick up, call her home. She didn't pick up. I said, okay. Three days later, I do the same thing at 3 a.m. She didn't pick up. This is after I told her, you, you know, you have a responsibility yeah. for everyone that's at that resort. Yeah, 24-7. Life safety, life safety, 24-7. You better have your phone on. And she didn't do it the second time, and she was gone. That changed the tone in the company pretty quick. Yeah. Because I'm not, I was never afraid of walking up to someone and say, you know what, I think it's time for you to leave. Or you don't look right today. You're not dressed appropriately. And if you're in hospitality, there are no beards and mustaches. You're front-facing guests. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. It's my standard, my standard. Yeah. yeah. And I hold the standard and I won't, you know, do this new age crazy stuff where, you know, hey, it's kind of a thing. No, it's not the thing. I'm more old school. And when I negotiated deals too, the legal contract, that's only as good as the two people shaking hands and agreeing to it. Because I, I don't want to be in a legal situation with anyone. And every one of my deals, everyone's made money and has done well. I don't even look at the documents. It's a waste of money with these lawyers. <laughs> either going to do what you said, either going to do what you said you're going to do, or you don't. Are you old school or are you litigious? I don't want to fight. Let's all make money together. Let's all do something where everyone wins. There's a good old song. You may want to listen to it. It's called Sometimes by Barry White. Okay. And it's, a, and it's a song that's an oldie but goodie. Listen to the words. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But they can't take your mind away. And they can't take your hard work away. That's you awesome. will persevere and survive and win. No, you listen to it. It's good. You're probably oh. too young for that. Well, I've, I've got a, uh, I got an old soul. So um, my dad was much older than my mother. So I, I grew up well, with that. Uh, Different generational upbringing. Good. I love it. Midwest, Midwest roots. Gotta yeah. Love it. Midwest roots. My dad was born in 1920, Italian. Oh, wow. 
Wow. Lots Love of it. lots of interesting stories about about that cuz he grew up in little Italy and wow. all, of, all of my aunts and uncles had some sort of involvement if you know what I mean because it's what they so what? that's what they had to do when you, they you know coming so, up through, so, through through the depression. So you've been in hospitality your whole life. My whole life. I mean, one you're of my ge- you're genetically you're <laughs> yes. genetically ingrained hospitality. Well, ab- come from absolutely. An Italian or, Italian or Jewish family. You yep. just you got it. Yeah, and I grew up in a Jewish neighborhood, and and my. Oh, father, you got you're the double. You're yeah, like, you're, you're like double bread. Yeah, and my father, my father ran. Uh, he was a truck driver uh, by legal, yeah. you know, paycheck, but he also ran a couple of okay. flea markets, and so my entrepreneurialism came from being forced to work in a flea market every weekend at 7 a.m. and learning how to interact with people at the age of 10 and having to negotiate and make deals at the age of 10. Ah, I love it. Sounds like we're the same. Yeah, we have a lot of similarities. Grandfather, my grandfather was in South Water Market in the produce business. Yeah. So on Christmas trees, cranberries and watermelons. I saw that. He was the watermelon, watermelon man. Watermelon man in the Midwest, number two in the world. That's Number two great. in the U.S. They called my dad the merchandise man. He always, <laughs> you know, at a young age, the things that we were selling in the flea market, we were, um, you know, we were selling members-only jackets and Gloria oh, Van. You still got one of those? I that's, still, that's I still have that. someone, someone. I have it somewhere, but I mean, they all fell off the back of a truck, and we were selling them. <laughs> I love it. So we didn't know I, that I, his kids what, what we were doing. All I know is I'd hire you in a second to work with me. <laughs> Well, awesome. I may, I may apply after we're finished interviewing. Yeah, we just have to find a company to buy. So. All right. No problem. So let's talk a little bit about one of my favorite things in your book is this line, a culture of no is a culture of losing. And that is so wow. And it goes hand in hand with the meaning of yes. But you have five principles that the meaning of yes are grounded in. Can you touch on those? Well, you know, let's go back to something I think that's equally as important. Sure. It's uh, communication, collaboration, and no stagnation. Basically, get mm-hmm. things done. Love it. Love it. And, and, if, and if you do those things, everything falls into place. And you have to keep things simple. And the simpler you keep them, you know, the better off it's going to be for the company and the team and the guest experience. And the guest experience is everyone. So it goes back to what I talked to before. We're all in the hospitality business. It's kind of unique. Mm-hmm. And no book has been written. No book has been written like this. And I have many more stories. Over oh, I bet you decades, do. Decades and decades. Because in the hotel business, we don't talk about those stories. Because every, <laughs> guest has a private, every guest has a privacy. Yeah. But uh, every time I think I've seen everything, then something new popped up. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, wow, that, that, that threw me for a curve. And you just deal and you, you know, you either love it or you don't. And those that just kind of thought it was a job, don't do it. It's not for you. And I would say that in any job you have, I tell my, my young adult kids, be passionate. If someone want to make money, someone want to be academic, I'm like, do whatever makes you happy. You know, I had a, I think you would love this. I had, um, I worked a little bit in the Marriott industry and had to do some, uh, so you, so you bleed, so you bleed red. <laughs> I wasn't there very long. I uh, well, I didn't, I didn't last, I didn't last too long with Bill Marriott either. Yeah. I, have a they, funny, I have a funny story. I have a funny story if you want to talk about it. Oh sure, sure, sure. What did you do with Marriott? Tell me. I, I was a uh, well, I was with a hotel group, and they they owned a they had a franchise, a courtyard franchise. So what I was doing was training and. Oh. I was rolling out some branded training that needed to happen. That was a requirement, a Marriott requirement. And I was trying to get all these employees through this training within a certain amount of time that had to happen. So I took all of their online training and I turned it into instructor-led training just so we could get everybody through it. And so, and I infuse into that improv and it very interactive and getting them used to being uncomfortable. And one of the housekeepers was really aggravated and she said I hated that exercise because I say you know be be honest it's I don't you know say how you feel because I can always find a teachable moment I really hated that why'd you hate that 
Well, because because it required me to make eye contact with other people. And I said, okay. Then you shouldn't be in this job. Right, right. So I go, okay. Um, well, you do know we're in the hospitality business and making eye contact with guests is important. You know, we're going to talk about the 510 rule. We're going to, you, these are things that are important. Well, I don't like people. And then I finally, like I was, not, I was trying not to lose it again. And I said, what would your ideal job be? Let's just talk about that for a second. And she said, working in a factory. I said, clearly. I said, I would give some serious thought that you shouldn't be here anymore. Then she was gone within two weeks. She quit on her own. I mean, I did tell the GM and then he said some words to her, which I think upset her. And then she left. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you two stories. One. So I built a gym at our corporate offices. We had a lot of people, a couple thousand people. And I go to the gym every day. I built it for a lot of reasons. People that, you know, work out, work. And I used to provide food too for everybody. And in the gym one day and I'm watching CNBC and I'm on the treadmill and a woman comes in and she changes the channel to Ellen. <laughs> and then she pulls out Kentucky fried chicken. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> and I'm, I, I'm like having an out of body experience. So I'm texting as I'm on the treadmill, not, not trying to fall off. I said, <laughs> Would you please come down to the gym right now? The guy comes down, and a girl and a woman comes down. They come down, like, and I go, hey, guys, see what I see? And they go, oh. They talk to her. Then we changed the channel back to CNBC, and I worked out, and she left the gym. It was her first day. <gasps> it was her first day. And she worked in accounting. And I said, you know, folks, let's see what happens tomorrow. If she shows back up for work tomorrow, <laughs> don't ever let her go. Because she'll never forget this story. Because she didn't know who I was. <laughs> she had no idea I was the chairman and CEO. <laughs> and I just was so cool about it. And I learned a good lesson. Let's test, train, and let's see what happens. I, you know, and I don't believe in, you know, the way the Marriott's came up. And they were my partners in a project. We didn't get along so well. Because, you know, Mr. Marriott was a control freak and so am I. And we're talking about carpet in our corridors in Las Vegas for our new project. And I brought them into Las Vegas. They never would go because, you know, they're of their family and their upbringing. Yeah, yeah. And Las Vegas was evil. Yeah. Las Vegas was evil. Right. Um, it's not so evil. It's the largest destination in the United States, you know, flip-flopped with Orlando. And I was giving them my advice with regard to corridor carpet. And Mr. Marriott wanted this yellow fleur-de-lis swirly carpet and i'm like no 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 we have equal rights here so i flew to bethesda and i'm sitting and talking to mr marriott i'm like bill i know i'm a young kid but this ain't gonna work he goes but this is what we do everywhere i go but mr marriott always respectful this ain't gonna work he goes why I go, because things happen in Vegas that we don't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see that coming. <laughs> things happen. <laughs> like, I may have to wet back the carpet at 3 a.m. because somebody <laughs> bleed it out on the carpet. Oh, my gosh. You know, the number one place people commit suicide is hotels. Yeah. Because they don't want to die. They don't want to die in their home, but nobody talks about it. I'm not afraid to talk about it. And, you know, we have secrets because we have a code, but we deliver epic hospitality. And you either love it or you don't. Yeah. And like you said, with that young lady, she did not belong. No. And I, I say to young adults today, when I talk at business school, especially these kids that are, they all want to be successful, which I admire. I said, how many of you would like to take risk? Half the hands drop. Mm-hmm. I said, well, I guess you're not going to be entrepreneurs because you're going to sometimes win and sometimes lose. And you got to take risk. And if you don't take risk, you can't truly be an entrepreneur that's self-starting. Yeah. You can work within a company in a framework, but you have to acknowledge who you are and what you'd like to be and how you want your passion to become and be happy every day. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Do you think that that risk-taking skill, I mean, I, I look at you and I, and we have some very similar kind of paths and upbringings. And I give a lot of credit to the way I was raised. And, you know, like you said, it's, it's in my blood to be an entrepreneur. It always has been. 
I went and got jobs throughout the years because I felt like I needed to work for other people just to see what was going on in that world. And then I always returned to entrepreneurism. But do you think some of that risk taking is innate that you're born with it or that maybe it was something that you learned? It's a really good question because my, my grandfather was that guy. Yeah. I didn't know him that long. He died when I was 13. My father was not, but my father wanted to be that guy, but I became that guy. Mm. So it's innate, innate, innate. Yeah, there is genetics to this. And look, I'm dyslexic. I can't read. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, I, I haven't read a book since I was in ninth grade and I cannot write well. And all these, my book proceeds, for example, are, you know, working on dyslexia research right. and you know, tra- training and coaching. And somehow uh, through, through all of that, even through the dyslexics, I was going to ask you about I that, have, how that was a challenge for you from a business perspective, I but I think you've done okay. Well, I actually told my executives one day when I found out my son was dyslexic because it's genetic. And I said, hey, I just figured out why my emails are crazy. I can't read or write. I'm dyslexic. <laughs> and, then, and they're like, oh my God, now we get it. Because your emails were like all over the place. We thought you were psycho. <laughs> but I, I don't even know where a period goes. <laughs> when, when were you, at what point were you diagnosed? Because it was way after you got out of college, right? About like six years ago. Wow. And I'm going to be 57. So. Wow. Well, you seem to do okay, despite all that. <laughs> I'll survive. I can't believe I survived. But you know what? Dyslexic young adults, young kids, even if you're older, you have a gift, a gift of dealing with 10, 12 things at one time. Chaos is good. You don't shy away and you solve problems. You just can't go A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Yeah. You go A to Z. Yeah. You already figured it out. It's in your mind. You're creative. You know, I build and design hotels and homes. Mm-hmm. You learn a different way. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Let's talk a little bit about, you started to hit a little bit on about young people and, you know, in this age where technology and automation and generational differences are kind of changing the face of business, what strategies would you suggest for leaders to be focused on or entrepreneurs to be focused on? Put down your phone. Don't look at it every five seconds. Mm -hmm. Call somebody. Call them. Call them. Talk to them. By the way, face-to-face is fine. You don't have to really do that. But talk, talk, talk. No texting. Talk. Yeah. And don't put up the greatest and best social media picture you have of yourself on whatever medium you use. It's dumb. It's not real. We all have good days. We all have bad days. We all laugh. We all cry. But show your passion and show up and stay in your lane. Don't think you're going to be the next billionaire because that ain't really possible. But you can be a millionaire if you work really hard. And then who knows? Maybe something great happens. If you get lucky and you're at the right place, right time, and you have gut, and you take risk, and you get beaten up a little bit, and you're okay with that because not everyone can handle it, right? Mm -hmm. Can you handle getting beaten up? Can you handle being responsible for not just your family, but for thousands of families. Can you be responsible for millions of guests? I mean, when I explained the business to my young kids, as they grew up, they really didn't understand. I'm like, you know how many people I'm responsible for every day? Every day. Why do you think daddy was working so hard? Do you think this just came easy? It was like a dot-com lucky strike? No. I worked really, really, really hard. The old-fashioned way. I earned it. It's an old euphemism, euphemism, but it's still true. Yeah. And the young adults need to know this. There's no free lunch. Work your ass off. Be passionate. Right? 100%. Here's a random tangent question that just came to mind for me because of your hotel background. I'm based in, I'm from Chicago, but I'm I'm based in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, which uh, it's like a timeshare world here for for one. No, I've I've been there. Our primary industry is tourism. We're a destination. And, you know, we have just gone through Hurricane Florence. We had Hurricane Matthew two years ago. And an interesting challenge that we have as a community is 
building back up every time there's a hurricane. And, and we didn't get nearly the damage like they got in Florida with Michael. But what are some thoughts that you might have, advice you would give other hoteliers on how to bounce back from that, especially when national media is saying, Myrtle Beach is closed. Don't go there. You can't travel there. And we're seeing uh, uh, all of the businesses uh, uh, be impacted. Uh, wrong, wrong, wrong. How about we're alive and well and only show how great everyone is because we all rebound, things happen, and we survive. We take care of the community first mm -hmm. and then we grow. It, it's funny because I went through this in Cabo when Edna uh -huh. occurred. Yeah. And I was a first responder, and you feel for the people. I actually cried. I was crying because they were so persevering. They wanted to survive. And I brought down food for them, baby food, bottles of water, diapers, rice, beans. And when I was there, I just saw their eyes. And this goes back to what I tell the young adults. You have to check in. You got to show up. You can't operate from your office. You have to be in the field and talk to everyone and see what's going on. Have dinner. Go have a couple of drinks. Get to know one another. You teach them about you. Let them teach you about them. Absolutely. And, no one better. and then you have some perspective. Well, that reminds me, of, in your book, you also had a quote. You said, leadership is hollow without ownership. It goes to passion. You have to own what you're doing. You have to walk the talk. You can't just say and regurgitate what somebody is teaching you. You have to live it and love it and mean it. And if you do those things, you'll do really well. Clearly, it has worked for you extremely well. What's one piece of advice as we get ready to wrap up, one piece of advice that you would give to entrepreneurs in their business, especially in scaling their business and building their businesses bigger? What would be some advice that you would give around that? Get up early, stay late, do what your passion is, and don't be afraid of taking risks. Great advice. It's been a, so awesome having you on this podcast today. I, I know how busy you are. I really appreciate it. The second I saw you on Undercover Boss, I'm like, oh, would it be so great to have him on my podcast? And then you were served up to me. It was such a gift. Well, you're a gift to me. Aw, thanks. Keep in touch. Keep I, in touch. I will. And as we, as we wrap up, I always like to ask this, and we'll, and we'll put it in our, our show notes, but if people want to learn more about you, your book, your company, what are the best ways to reach out to you? Uh, StephenJClubeck.com or CheckingIn.com or find me through you. I'm available 24-7. Oh. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, we're going to wrap up, so... One more time, Stephen, thank you for being on The Pivotal Leader today. No, thank you. Thank you. And there are very few people, I got to tell you, that I have the patience to sit and talk to. And I want to talk to you more. I want to learn more about you. Awesome. You. Well, well, that is, um, that is thrilling to me. That is such a great compliment. Thank you. Thank you to all of our listeners today. Really appreciate you listening to this really awesome podcast. I said it would be epic, and it was. And don't forget, if you want to maximize, you need to improvise. Now it's time for that cool voiceover guy to take us out. You've been listening to The Pivotal Leader with Gina Tremarco, owner and founder of Pivot 10 Results and Carolina Improv Company. You can find show notes for this episode on our website at thepivotalleader.com. The Pivotal Leader is a production of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. If your company needs help pivoting to success, visit pivot10results.com or email Gina at gina at pivot10results.com. And until next time, if you're feeling stuck in your business, it's probably time to pivot.